good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome to today's webinar entitled Back in the Game, the impact of a world pandemic on prosthetics and socket fit. This will be presented by Dr. Robert Gailey. Uh, we're so happy that you're all here with us today. My name is Kurt Grubin. I am a CPO with OSER and uh, is, I am a clinical specialist with the OSER Global Academy and I'll be your host of today's seminar. But let me introduce to you firstly, uh, our, uh, our beloved Marika, who is uh, sitting in Eindhoven, Netherlands today. It's her evening right now, as it is for maybe some of you as well. Marika is our, our um, education program manager in OSER Global Academy. Uh, when she's running these webinars, we refer to her, her as queen of the world because she is controlling everything in the background of this webinar, uh, who gets to speak, who's showing on the screen. And she will also be monitoring the chat box uh, below. We'd like you to use that chat box if you have any types of questions related to connectivity or getting uh, onto the webinar. She can help you uh, with that during this webinar. Uh, so keep that in mind, you can use the chat box for that function. And thank you, Marika, for guiding uh, this ship during, during this webinar. I also like to call your attention to Jan Christensen, who is sitting up in Denmark right now. Uh, he is our Academy Director for our Emerging Markets. He is a CPO and he will be monitoring the Q&A section. So I'm going to, going to encourage you, if you scroll to either the top of the bottom top or the bottom of your screen, you will find the Q&A section. If you click on that, it will bring up a window that allows you to enter a question. Uh, and if you have a question for Bob or our guest, Joe, both of whom I will introduce in just a little bit. But if you have any questions for any of the presenters today, please put those in the Q&A section. Uh, bring all of your questions to us and uh, we'll be happy to ask those of Joe and Bob uh, as we move through the two question and answer sessions, one near the middle of today's presentation and one near the end. Uh, you will see a raised hand function. We prefer you do not use that during the webinar, but I will cue you to do that a little bit later in today's webinar. I'd like to take some time to introduce to you a special guest of ours today. Uh, his name is Joe Gossett. Joe hails from Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, some of you may be thinking of a Beach Boys song right now. I can't help but think of that when I say Kokomo. Uh, but uh, Joe is joining us to give us a little bit of a patient perspective, an amputee's perspective on how uh, life was managed through this time of the pandemic over the last year. So he has pre-recorded a video for us uh, and, and we will share that with you today. He is also available to us live to be able to answer some questions that you may have for him later in today's presentation. With that, I would love to introduce you to our, our main presenter for today, Dr. Robert Gailey. Dr. Gailey, as many of you know, brings just a, a, a wealth of knowledge and information to us uh, time and time again, an energy that is unmatched by anybody I know on the planet Earth in, in bringing us the excitement of what we can learn about prosthetics, what we can learn about rehabilitation in and around the field of prosthetics. As many of you know, Bob is a, uh, a professor at the University of Miami. He also, uh, along with his education in, in uh, physical therapy, is also educated in prosthetics and orthotics uh, from Strathclyde University. And that happens to be where he did a lot of the work on the amputee mobility predictor. Bob continues to do all kinds of research work and is well published. Much of that research is based around biomechanics of, of uh, walking with a prosthesis and rehabilitation around, in and around prosthes uh, prosthetics. Bob, of course, has also led many of the mobility clinics across the, the world and, uh, and uh, continues to, uh, to hold those mobility clinics where he teaches people how to just simply become more active and more mobile on their prosthesis. So with that, it's my great pleasure on behalf of OSER to welcome you all to today's uh, webinar and to welcome Dr. Robert Gailey uh, to, to fill us with great information during today's time. Bob? 
Kurt, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, it is so great to be back. I wish we were back in, in a little bit closer circumstances, but I can't thank Oser enough for allowing us to convene in uh, a state-of-the-art way. We're all sitting at our desk and having a chance to uh, share a little information. Um, and for the people who brought that together, as Kurt mentioned, Marika, Jan, and Kurt have just worked tirelessly over uh, the last several weeks to make it happen. So I'm very excited and very grateful to be here. And I also welcome uh, Mr. Joe Gossett uh, from Kokomo over and uh, SRT. Joe, I've got a chance to meet with him a little bit, and he's really a special mm -hmm. gentleman. So what I'd like to do is kind of just review with folks um, what's coming up and then what we're going to do today. Uh, so uh, we, this is the first of three uh, global webinars uh, that OSER is uh, bringing to you. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, getting back in the game uh, as the world hopefully emerges from the pandemic. Um, then in October, it's back to sport. Um, as some of you may have been watching on TV, the Paralympics just begun two days ago. Uh, and is terrific competition. So we thought we might talk a little bit about uh, the loss of limbs should not be a limitation to uh, four or two recreational activities in sports. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that and how we might be able to get our patients um, back into the game and the things that they wanna do. Um, then in December, we're gonna talk a little bit about powered prosthetics um, and power prosthetics are really emerging. Uh, we're seeing uh, different technologies really grab hold. It is the wave of the future. And um, what do you need to do in order to allow your patients to take full advantage of it? So that's what's coming up in October and December. So let's talk about today. Um, what I'd like to do is start off with just a little bit about the impact of COVID and with limb loss. Um, this is an area that I think we're all gonna have to deal with. Uh, we don't know very much about it, but let me share a little bit about what I do know. And then uh, Joe is gonna take a moment. We have a pre-recorded uh, tape uh, of Joe's experience over the time of quarantine and uh, what has transpired since. And then he'll be there immediately after uh, the recording to answer any of your questions. But I think Joe has some wonderful insights that may be representative of the population that you see in your clinic every day. Um, then uh, we talked with Kurt and Kurt is graciously um, consented to talk a little bit about uh, sockets and what kind of socket solutions you might have in order to deal with the ever-changing limb volume that we're dealing with. And I know that that's a very difficult subject on a, uh, a normal, under norm, normal circumstances. Had a tough time spitting that out. But um, what we're finding is uh, there are some greater challenges currently and ahead. So uh, Kurt has some uh, interesting thoughts and some solutions that may be advantageous to you and to your patients. And then finally, uh, training. How do we get folks who are coming back? And you'll hear is that folks have lost weight, gained weight, lost muscle, um, and or just been inactive. And so how can we help folks getting back? And we have uh, some nice videos that you can access and share with your patients this afternoon, if you'd like. Um, and then some final thoughts. So let's jump right into it. Um, the time goes quickly. Um, but not the last year. It's been a very long and arduous last year uh, globally. And as uh, everybody is aware, uh, I don't think if we went back 18 months ago, anybody would have fathom that there would be over 200 million cases of COVID and over 4 million deaths as a result of this deadly disease. And we're not out of the woods yet. It continues to uh, pack uh, emergency rooms, um, become uh, a threat to many, many communities. And there seems to be some underlying issues that come with COVID. Um, and these are the secondary effects. Now, everything I'm about to present is 
data that was uh, gleaned probably about this time last year. It didn't make it to publication until the end of 2020. There's a couple of, of uh, articles that are emerging in 2021. So this data is at best just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but unfortunately, there's kind of been a halt on getting publications out because most of those that are collecting the data and publishing these journal articles are back in the ERs and back in the hospital caring for um, the folks with the new Delta variant. And by the way, none of what I'm presenting has anything to do with the Delta variant. Uh, we don't know what we don't know about the Delta variant. Um, but initially, when we uh, or when I say we, the medical community, uh, began to look at uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus of COVID-19, just so happens to start in 2019, is that it would cause an inflammatory uh, response within uh, the respiratory system, primarily the, primarily the lungs. And as a result, there was immune activation that was taking place where the body was trying to heal itself. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but there was this uh, response that took place uh, with thrombin and the thrombin produces, and it's in the blood plasma, produces this fibrin. And the fibrin initially begins to heal, but it's that uh, material that's relatively sticky that tends to heal tissue, but when it creates a, uh, a, a can create a clot, but when it sticks together, it can break loose from the lungs. And that's why we're seeing an increase in the number of strokes, pulmonary emboli, myocardial infarctions, and deep vein thrombosis or blood clots within the circulatory system of the limbs, which is leading to amputation. In addition, that this uh, release of thrombin as it goes into the uh, arterial system is what we're seeing is an increase in acute ex limb ischemia. And that acute limb ischemia is because there's this hypercoagulability that occurs because of the increased fibrin with the body trying to attack the virus. And if a clot is formed within an area, it can easily shut down the circulation. The other things you'll see are chablains, um, which chablains is the discoloration due to um, the uh, irritation and inflammation within small vessels about the foot. Um, the other thing that you'll see is bullae, which are these clear filled, very large blisters that a person can walk in with uh, dried gangrene and all of these become life-threatening because if the patient gets to this point and you start to see within your patient population distinct skin changes that don't belong there, they must get to the emergency room immediately. We are seeing an increase in major amputations. Um, and again, please note that all of the evidence that I'm providing is the latest evidence as of uh, last week um, but that the numbers are quite small in all of these studies, but it's kind of having this trend to what we're seeing basically across the globe. In fact, the first to talk about was Senna, which saw a 50% increase in amputations in her hospital in Italy. Now, that went from five to nine patients from 2019 to 2020, but that is also what was seen in the, uh, in the Netherlands with Chauvin's uh, study, where they went from 15% to 42% of people that um, were part of the lockdown and had severe, co uh, severe comorbidity, um, ended up having an increase um, uh, in amputations. You also see that 94% of patients with COVID um, had proximal thrombi in this group of uh, uh, folks who ended up having an amputation. So I'm not saying 94% of all people with COVID. Remember, these are very small, but in our world, these are very large numbers uh, compared to 40% in the control patients, again, 32, um, that were in this uh, group that was out of Belgium and the Netherlands. In New York, 
um, patients with COVID-19 and all symptoms of acute limb ischemia um, only were more likely to avoid amputation or death. But if they also had acute limb ischemia with pulmonary or systemic symptoms, then it jumped up immediately. So again, it's kind of a thing that, well, if you just had limb ischemia, there's a chance for revascularization. But if you had secondary complications, especially to the lungs, things were not as promising. Another study by Caruso out of uh, Naples, again, a small N, but the difference in amputations from 2019 with 38 and, um, uh, and then an N of 25 in 2020, um, there seemed that the reason for admission and what the, the issues were with this population is one, there was a greater number of people doubled the number amount that went into the emergency room. There also um, was no difference in most markers with this group, except the albin to cretin ratio. That has to do uh, with chronic kidney disease, but that is a large portion of our population. But there was a significant increase in those who presented with um, uh, gangrene. And remember, the numbers didn't change between this group, but look what happened when you look at the number of amputations. It went from seven to 15. So what we're seeing is the characteristics of these people, it seems to be more critical and the vascular system seems to be more attacked. And much of this had to do with the lockdown and then those that missed the typical management of their diabetic foot ulcer. And that really becomes the key. They didn't have regular clinical follow-up. They may have had issues that weren't addressed right away. They may be afraid to go to the physician. They may have had open ulcers. Things started to mount up. Belarosta, um, in probably one of the more recent articles that came out in December with an end of 20 patients, again, talking about very small, uh, uh, very small populations, and all the patients had, again, acute limb ischemia, lack of blood uh, to the limb, and all required urgent revascularization because right here, you can see this is the clot. This is about the only place that um, the, um, blood can get through to bring nutrients to, to the tissue. Um, and so from that group of 20, 17 surgeries were performed, 12 did revascularize, five did not, and eight died. So it's all due again to this virus hypercoagulable state in which there seems to be a greater amount of clotting associated with acute limb ischemia and um, um, uh, uh, COVID. So again, what happens, and this is looking at the lungs with the epithelium uh, space, and here's the uh, alveolar space, but when the SARS virus attacks an area, then your body reacts with an inflammatory response with neutrophils and macrophages and what have you to try to heal and to take away um, uh, the invading uh, uh, tissue or the uh, invading virus. And what happens is that automatically produces the thrombin. And the thrombin then uh, creates the fibrin in normal state to heal during the inflammation process. But this becomes so abnormal is that we start to see this really pronounced increase. And this is where both the arterial venous um, um, areas are attacked due to the increased thrombus that occurs, occurs because of the fiber. In short, we're seeing more clots related to um, this, this process than was ever expected. And you would think, okay, this has just got to be with those patients that are at high risk. Was interesting in the Boswell uh, study that just came out, and they presented just a couple of case studies, but this is representative of all the case studies. It was a 45-year-old male who presented to the ER with discoloration of the left lower limb over the last four days. Wasn't long, just the last four days. He did have hypertension. 
However, no cardiac disease, diabetes, arteriosclerosis, obliterans, ischemia, and did not smoke. Yet he tested positive with COVID um, 16 days prior to admission to the hospital. He spent 10 days in the ICU and two days um, observed and then had to receive an amputation because of the clot that occurred in the common iliac artery supply. And you can see here in this picture, that there's literally no circulation coming down through the left limb that should be there. It's just totally cut off due to the thrombus. Um, so the transformal amputation was performed. It was discharged within 13 days uh, after that point. Um, and so in summary, without going into all the other articles, what we're seeing in three of these out of New York and one from uh, Italy is that the population that seems to have this arterial thrombotic complications are those that are in their 60s. They have greater BMI than is optimal. They have uh, a history of hypertension, diabetes. Um, some have chronic kidney disease and some have peripheral artery disease. This is the population we're used to seeing. The outcome for, again, very small ends with this is unfortunately about 40% have a hot, 40% is the mortality rate or 40% die. And then what we see is between um, 12 and 30% uh, are having amputations. And those are some pretty high numbers. Those are way above and significantly different according to all of the literature. So, in summary, what we're looking at, just so we don't think that this is happening with everybody, these are still really small numbers, but in our world, these are big numbers that we're seeing with an uptick in amputations. So what we're seeing is that the uh, hospitalization prevalence um, is about 700 out of 1,000. It's less than 1% of people are hospitalized um, out in the but that's still high, oh, less than 1% are hospitalized because of COVID out of the general population. Four to uh, uh, 21 uh, per 100,000 are hospitalized. From the general population with, um, uh, again, looking at the uh, acute limb ischemia, we're seeing in the general population approximately 10 to 15 per 100,000. Those are pretty big numbers when you look at in a normal situation in life is never going to be that high. It's more like um, um, a, a very small fraction. Less than 50% of patients with COVID um, associated with arterial uh, limb ischemia or acute limb ischemia underwent attempts at limb salvage and 15% required limb amputation. Um, and then there was also severe respiratory manifestation. On top of that, what one article um, uh, suggested is that there's also a prolonged rehabilitation time with these folks because the, uh, the getting the to rehab, getting the care, and the complications that are associated with this were re relatively high. And again, let me emphasize, none of this has to do with the Delta variant. So, in short, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what's occurring now with folks that haven't come out or haven't socialized and have self-quarantined or stayed out of the general population or afraid to go to the hospital right now, which is a global issue. Um, but suffice it to say, I believe that we are going to see an increase in the number of people with complicated um, they had amputations due to complications due to COVID, and they're going to be a difficult population to rehabilitate and get back um, into uh, the life that they had prior to uh, limb loss. Just want to finish up with a couple of things. The quarantine and isolation is a major impact for COVID, whether you were somebody that had uh, a disability or some other um, uh, issues in your life beforehand, we all suffered. We all watched a heck of a lot too much Netflix. We all made a lot too many uh, uh, sourdough breads, and we also ate a few more chocolate chip cookies. Now, many of us can kind of joke about this. However, 
um, in a publication that just came out um, or in October of, of 2020 from the American Psychological Association. Again, this is a small number. It's only a survey of 3,000 people after um, one year after uh, COVID was declared by the World Health Organization, 61% of Americans reported an undesired weight gain or loss. 42% had gained an average of 29 pounds. 18% had lost an average of 26 pounds. 10% had gained 50 pounds. In that group that gained 50 pounds, mental health changes were very common in that cohort. Um, 30% were sleeping more, 30 some odd percent were sleeping less, 34% were just right. It's kind of like the Goldilocks um, position. But if you look at that, is that almost 65% of people were either getting too much or too little sleep due to the stress related to COVID, which is going to bring on, again, secondary issues. 23% of us drank a little bit more to cope with the stress, 47% uh, delayed or canceled health services. This is the population we were just talking about. And 48% of parents have increased stress and 62% of that was related to the home learning and having to deal with the patients. So uh, deals with patients, deal with their children and the homeschooling and try to maintain their uh, place in the workplace and that type of thing. So um, when we look at those that were home and 22% in this Ziegler study had gained five to 10 pounds, what they looked at what was related to that increase in eating, sight and smell. You smell those chocolate chip cookies coming out of the oven, you're gonna want a chocolate chip cookie and probably a glass of milk. The eating response to stress, not one cookie, but two cookies, maybe three cookies will be needed. Then snacking after dinner, I only had three cookies during lunch. I'll have another after dinner. There's another good Netflix uh, series for me to binge through. And then I can't sleep because I'm watching the Netflix and I'm not going to get up tomorrow and exercise because I was up all night watching reruns of Breaking Bad. So as a result is that the, the idea is that these are unhealthy behaviors. In fact, if you think drinking was the answer, 21% in the US and 17% internationally blame their weight on alcohol. And alcohol seems like a stress inducer. However, you're gonna get stress after I reveal to you is when you drink a glass of wine, two glasses of wine will equal a Snickers bar. Or if you have a 16 ounce beer, that will equal a Kit Kat or a Hershey bar. So when you think about having that next drink, think that you're eating another candy bar. If you drink a six pack, you just ate six Snickers. Alcohol and all seriousness can also disturb sleep and also alcohol dehydration can prompt eating. Um, so as a result, you wanna keep in mind the healthy behaviors, which means daily, uh, maintain the daily schedule. Now, we're no longer in quarantine. And, but as a result of the Delta variant, we are seeing altered life changes. People are wearing masks more. Um, people are um, um, at, at the university. I just had a meeting today um, with we're having the distancing and all the other things to try to help get this under control uh, and keep people well. Um, so because of this, we're going to have altered schedules. And so the idea is talking to your patients, remind them to maintain a daily schedule. Many of our patients are isolating. They don't go to school. They stay home and they don't go out. They're not going to the movies. They're not going to social events. They're not going anywhere. So they need to maintain that schedule. Um, they need to eat uh, and sleep regular times. They need to exercise. They need to maintain a routine. They need to get dressed every day. They need to wear their prostheses every day. Many people may have difficulty getting into their prostheses, and Kurt's going to talk to us about that because of the fluctuations in weight or the atrophy that's taking place. Um, they should clean their house. They should cook meals. They should find healthy alternatives. Just don't make the sourdough bread and cookies. Learn how to deal with kale. Um, portion control, um, smaller bites. Don't bring the serving uh, bowls in place out to the table, serve in the kitchen. These are all things that we all know, but at this time, we really need to kind of reinforce this with our patients 
And most of all, I need to get a good night's sleep, at least seven hours. So this has been a very difficult time for everyone, both us and our patients. And as a result, we have to be vigilant about this. And in between the things that we do for our patients, whether there's exercising or modifying the prostheses, is bring this conversation up, reinforce these ideas, and help give our folks um, some of the answers or let them understand um, that they're not alone through this, but there are things that they need to do. So what I'd like to do at this point is, oh, I forgot one last thing is don't forget is to set an exercise routine. We're going to talk about how to do that. The exercises should be short sessions, less than an hour. The exercises that you like, they should be easily reached goals. And you want to keep a, a diary of what you do. Find an exercise partner, even if you can't do it in person. It's always good through social media or the telephone, that archaic thing we, we used to use to chat with folks and to see, or your partner and see, did you exercise today? Did you do this? Did you um, do that? And let me tell you how well I did. And then the idea also is it very important for our folks so they don't get contractures and other things is to stretch, strengthen, work on their agility. And we're gonna give exercises like that, the exercises that you can do and where to get them. And then the last thing is that you need to maintain aerobic activity. You gotta get out and burn up some calories. Now, I know that uh, most of the kennels and rescue uh, facilities went through a lot of doggies in the last year, but as many people have, have proven in some of the literature is that if you want regular exercise, you need to walk your dog and you need to walk yourself. So get a dog and you can go out and um, both of you can enjoy each other's company, have a stress reliever and get some exercise in the interim. Okay, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Joe Gossett. Um, Kurt and uh, Joe have been uh, talking and Joe has some wonderful insights on what COVID was like for him over the past year and what were some of the ramifications of having to endure COVID with some terrific insights that I think you may want to share with your patients to let them know that you understand um, what they've gone through. But I'm going to let Joe talk about this in his own words. Hi, my name is Joe Gossett, and I am an amputee. I'm a transfemoral amputee, have been since 2013, which is the time of this recording. It puts us uh, just uh, going on eight years. Um, I'm 75 years old. I am actively employed as an, a mechanical engineer in the automotive industry. I also run a business in the evenings. Um, we talk about the impact of, of COVID on us in the last year. Prior to COVID, um, I rode motorcycles. I played golf. Um, I walked quite a bit. i uh, done some hiking and, um, and then just worked. Uh, since the, the amputation, I now ride when I play golf. Um, I still walk quite a bit. I'm still working. And I do a lot of target shooting. Um, with COVID coming on, uh, the big thing, I was out of work for about six or eight weeks while uh, workplaces were making uh, provisions so that we could work safely again. Uh, I did so at my own workplace, uh, so that meant social distancing, wearing masks, uh, temperature taking several times a day, hand washing, all the precautions that you know of. Um, the fact that I could go back to work meant that I was active and I didn't have some of the uh, problems or issues that other people had being an amputee and not being active because being active is the main thing. I um, was able to uh, to get out, but where uh, I really suffered, to, so to speak, was not being able to see my medical doctors or to see my prosthetist. And at the time that we got shuttered in with the COVID, I was just a little over a year into my socket. And by the time I was able to come through it for a year and three months or so, 
and get into SEMA processes, I had shrunken considerably because I have been very active in, you know, during that time. Um, when I did get to seam, I had shrunken nearly an inch in circumference on every measurement. Uh, to compensate for that, when I couldn't get into seam, I had been putting in pads in my socket. I had started employing a second seal and I was using multiple layers of socks to try to fill it in and to make it work. Uh, no matter how much we try to do that, it just doesn't measure up at all to not to, to so to speak, to just the precise fit that you get from your processes. Uh, consequently, um, I was developing bad habits in my gait. Now that I have been refit and I've been in my socket for about six to eight weeks, uh, I am now working to try to regain and eliminate some of those bad habits that I've developed. Um, the other aspect of, that I saw that I, I felt um, bothered by from COVID uh, had a real effect on my life was a lot of the social aspects. Uh, we were no longer uh, going to weddings, funerals, high school graduations, sporting events, going to the theater. All the things that we had done that our, I was involved in our life were gone. They, they weren't there anymore. I would go to work, I'd come home, and my wife and I would spend time together, which was fine. We got along great. But there was all the other things that her and I had been doing together. We are no longer doing this. Uh, the fact that I was able to go to work allowed me to be active. It demanded that I be active. When on the weekends, when I wasn't working, I was looking for activity. I was the guy that ran to the store and ran to the drugstore to get things we needed. Um, so again, I was looking for activity. If I got to the store and somebody else, all the handicap spots were filled, I really didn't care. I'm going to park as close as I can and I'm going to walk. I need the exercise. I need the activity. I'm not training for the Olympics. I just need to be active. And I, I look for this constantly when I'm out. Um, there's other things that uh, it, we need to do is just to, to stay physically active. We don't have to need a trainer. We, we just need to do things physically and safely. That was just everything that I had done. So right now I'm ready to take your questions and so you can ask me more about what I've been doing. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we'll have Joe come on video here in just a little bit. Um, so uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, this is excellent. I, give, I think it gives us a, a really good idea of, uh, of what, is, what is happening in, in the field and what, what it is it being experienced out in the field. Uh, Joe, I have your uh, first question for you. Um, one of them is, and I'll have you on, you just did it, came off of mute, thank you. Um, in your, the, the shrinkage that occurred, you believe that was a little bit more of your, your residual limb uh, muscle mass, or was that an overall uh, weight loss that, that you underwent uh, during COVID? No, I'm, I'm reasonably sure mine was uh, a loss of, of muscle mass. It was, I think, attributed to the loss of uh, uh, muscles that had atrophy that no longer had a function uh, in, my, uh, in my upper leg. Uh, I think I lost some of the, the fascia around the bone uh, just from activity and, and the normal shrinkage. Um, but it was really seemed to be accelerated during that year, uh, during the COVID. Excellent. Uh, one question just came up from Curtis, and Curtis, thank you for for popping this into the uh, the question box. Uh, um, Joe, any thoughts on getting PT during the or getting physical therapy during the lockdown uh, to help manage your inactivity or gait deviations? Did you do you undergo any of that kind of PT, uh, or or how did you manage that? Well, I actually considered uh, getting PT during that time because I was having some trouble with my gait. I was developing bad problems. 
I, but that problem again is, is everybody was in lockdown. So trying to get into a physical therapist, uh, unless it was an absolute necessity, uh, you, you were down on the list on priority wise. And I really felt that I knew what I needed to do. I just needed to work at it. And I needed to make sure I got in uh, to get the socket refitted because uh, that was going to be the big thing. Once I got my socket refitted, now I could was more of a candidate for physical therapy. Excellent, Joe. And this leads me to a question for Bob. Bob, in, in your thoughts, you, you had the... Uh, um, you mentioned that some people gained weight, some people lost weight. Uh, why is this? What, what, uh, and they lost that, that volume in their sockets or they may have gained the volume in their sockets. Why both directions? Um, what we see is, that, and what has been attributed to is stress. Um, it's uh, folks gain weight because of stress or inactivity, which is the normal thing, but many people respond differently. And other people who are stressed about COVID, stressed about loved ones who had become ill, uh, tend not to eat as much. And so as a result, um, for those of us that don't wear prostheses, that, you know, in my case, to go in the back of the closet and get the fat boy pants out or just go to sweats. Um, but if you're a person that has to wear a socket every day, that's not an option. You now have to, as Joe mentioned, you have to get to the prosthetist. You need to be, uh, have accommodations for that. So it, it's, it's not the person's fault. It's how we all had to deal with this stressful situation. We all dealt with it differently. Um, but the consequences are greater if you have to wear a prosthesis. Ah, ah thank you. Um, well, for those of you in the audience, uh, we will have another time to ask questions. Uh, so uh, keep those questions coming into the Q&A section on your screen. Um, Jan will be monitoring those. And uh, thank you, Joe and Bob, for your answers there. Uh, some of your comments here, though, uh, I'll just lead right into this, this next slide. If we think about our patient population during this last year, many of them did undergo volumetric changes uh, in, in their socket. And it may have been from over, overeating or inactivity, a variety of things that might have caused an increase in, in volume and not able to get down into the prosthesis by, like before. But if we think about the implications here, if someone did not feel comfortable getting to their prosthesis, they may have just gone without the prosthesis, change their level of or their type of ambulation, maybe go to the wheelchair, maybe get the crutches, um, but uh, might have lost the opportunity to stay in the prosthesis and, and work with the prosthesis. Likewise, if stress was the inducer, then it could be a, a loss in, in muscle mass. Um, in, in Joe's case, it's just simply normal maturation of the limb. Uh, but yet he was in a similar situation of not uh, getting into the prosthesis as regularly as he would have. So we need to play that out. What does that look like then for our average user, our average patient, or I should say average patient, any patient, uh, is that this less frequency of getting into a prosthetist uh, and this idea of I need to have my, my, my socket redone or refitted uh, and, and maybe an amputee, they do know it does take time. Traditional methods of making a socket can be an evaluation, can be a, a measurement or taking a mold of the limb and then producing that socket that might be uh, days later, uh, and, and, but yet it still may take a second visit. The implications of family life where you may have more family that needs to stay at home with children who are not at school, but being homeschooled because of uh, the pandemic makes it more difficult for people to make those appointments and get into see a prosthetist and deal with those volumetric changes. So that's where these, these uh, concepts that actually have been around quite a while within the OSER family have come to a development where we're now uh, commercializing these products in the Connect TF socket, the Direct TF and TT sockets as well. All of these actually uh, gave us a really nice tool to use uh, with our caregiving over this last year. One of the primary aspects of this is that these products are very time efficient in provision of a socket. Uh, the Connect TF is an adjustable socket that can have iterative adjustments 
and makes it very efficient to be able to refit a socket for a user. The direct TT and TF are laminated sockets that can be made in a one visit. They're actually laminated directly onto the patient's residual limb and they can be done in a single visit. Both of these products can be fit in, in less than two hours in a facility. So as you imagine that person that is under is, is maybe at home, has that volumetric change, uh, now there's an opportunity for, oh, if I could get into a prosthesis and I could have my replacement socket done during that single visit, return home on a well-fitting socket, now the outlook changes, perhaps less stressful and perhaps more activity and maintaining a better level of activity. That's part of the impetus behind what we feel that these products in the connect and direct technologies can bring forward. Let's move to the next slide. The, the, the Connect TF is primarily aimed at, at uh, uh, the lower mobility population, those that might have dexterity issues, those that might have balance issues or not able to don a prosthesis while standing. Uh, so let me take you through a little bit of a map of what this product is and how it works. This is an adjustable transfemoral prosthetic socket that has conforming adjustable shells. They have some flexibility to them. There's a brim at the top that is also flexible as well. Along the side, it, both sides, you'll see these struts that have telescopic adjustment. There also happens to be two sizes of the Connect TF socket. So it can allow us not only to have one or two or the two different sizes, but also adjust each of those sizes to longer or shorter to match the residual limb length. Um, the uprights can also be adjusted to, to accommodate either a cylindrical or a conical shaped residual limb. So we can take those uprights and, and uh, pivot them in one direction or the other in order to accommodate for that. Uh, so um, the, uh, the lock mechanism that holds somebody into the prosthesis is actually done with a, we, we use a transfemoral locking liner and a clutch pin that can be secured into the bottom of the socket there. Where that button is located is a distal plate that actually can be either a medium or a large size. So we can accommodate different volumetric um, uh, presentations of the patient's residual limb. One of the really cool things about this process is what's all on the left side here. Uh, what we see here is in the oval is a, a, a closing handle. Uh, when this handle is disengaged or pulled upwards, it relaxes the cables uh, that are, it's Dyneema cables that are, are um, or cord would be a better term for it. It relaxes those cables and loosens the prosthesis. So it allows the prosthesis to be opened up uh, about one inch and allow somebody then to don the prosthesis, put their limb down into it. And then when the lever is closed, it closes to a preset tension that has been previously set by the prosthetist. So the, the patient can easily get their pin engaged and then close this lever down to tighten up the prosthesis. The other feature of this device is that uh, you can have iter iterative adjustments of the circumference. So there's a special area on the, on the side of the prosthesis where we can tighten up those cables or those cords with a torque wrench so we can identify the right amount of tension for each user and we can consistently tighten the prosthesis to that level for each user. So if, if that patient goes home and loses some weight, they would, or loses some limb volume, they would use some socks for the time being while they're at home to maintain the right fit of the socket, continue to use the lever to tighten the socket. But when they come back into the prosthetist, uh, then simply the prosthetist can use the torque wrench to reset the tension with zero socks and allow the person to have a snug fit yet again. And that process is really only about a five or 10 minute process by uh, the prosthetist. Uh, it is important for the prosthetist to have knowledge of fitting techniques, all the dynamics that we have in, in understanding mechanics of the fit of a prosthesis. You can adjust each of the zones. There's four zones separately. So you can get more distal pressure or more proximal pressure, whichever you would choose to use for your patient. Uh, as, we, as we think about the benefits for the patient, some of these, as I've already alluded to here, is that if there's volume fluctuation in a single visit, 
whether that's at the prosthesis facility or at the patient's home, it's very easy to do and very short. So we can, we can accommodate volumetric changes and not have to put a patient through a complete process of remaking another socket. It allows for a longer period of time of that patient using the same socket. It allows easier transfers and walking because it's easier to don and you can slip into the socket without tension. And then once locked into the socket, you can apply the tension, it makes it much easier for the user to don the prosthesis. Um, easy to clean, it's comfortable to sit for the user because of the, um, because of the, the conformable shells. Uh, for the prosthetist, there's all kinds of benefits here. Um, we know our time is valuable and efficiency of being able to see and provide care is of great importance. So the ability to either see somebody at their home or at a, a nursing care facility and deliver that prosthesis, that is absolutely possible with this, this technology. Uh, and also it's possible for iterative adjustments when someone loses volume or if they gain volume. Uh, you can easily uh, change that, that fit of the prosthesis simply with the torque wrenches, five to 10 minutes and you're set. Uh, the delivery timeline, one of the key benefits of this is it does allow us, uh, once the patient is ready, their limb is ready for fitting of a prosthesis, uh, we can get that prosthesis fit uh, that same day uh, once that patient is ready. And because it's an easier donning and doffing process, this also makes it much more readily used in the therapy environments, whether that be at the nursing home or home therapy, it's much easier for a family member or a therapist to don and doff the prosthesis and get onto the care of providing therapy for that patient. It's easy to demonstrate to a referral source for sure as well. The process of that iterative fitting is real simple. We're gonna go quickly through this. If you need to change the volume or the fit of that prosthesis, you simply can loosen the screws on the telescoping uprights and that gives you the right height. You can use the torque wrench to, to tune in the, uh, the uh, circumferential fit of the prosthesis. That's adjusting the torque. And then finally, you just set the angles of your uprights, which already kind of take the angle of the patient's limb. When you adjust the torque, you're simply locking those in place. Very simple process, very easy to repeat anytime you have uh, a chance to interface with your patient. So overall, when we think about this Connect TF, uh, folks that have difficulty with, uh, with their dexterity, uh, folks that might not have the ability to get into a prosthesis multiple times this makes it very easy for someone uh, to, to have their socket well-fitting uh, and, and can move forward with, Bob, if you can go to the next, next slide here, um, and it can be well-fitting for them. I forgot that I was gonna show you the donning process. This is actually pretty quick here. You'll see this gentleman, he's already put on the transmural locking liner. He engages the pin into this clutch lock, tightens that clutch lever there, and then uses the closing handle, closes that down to apply the tension that was preset by the prosthetist, and then he's ready to go and get up out of his chair. Note that this donning process is fully done while seated, and for any of your patients that might be thinking, well, oh, it's difficult for me to balance and push my limb down into a socket, this could be a really nice solution for them. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and just to wrap up with this, we do, we do see some benefit even outside of the low active amputee population, but that is our primary target for this particular uh, device. Uh, when you think about your, your COVID affected patients, think about the benefit of if you could simply uh, get a socket fit to them in one visit, this could solve that problem. They don't have to be thinking about those multiple visits as much as they would normally. And ultimately what we're looking for is giving us the opportunity as prosthetists and caregivers to expand the scope of who we can fit with the prosthesis. Uh, there's many that might not be fit with the transformal prosthesis because of dexterity, balance issues, the complication of how to get and don a prosthesis. This simplifies that prosthesis quite a bit. Move on to the other concept here, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, uh, is that uh, also helpful for this time is that if you have somebody who's actively on their prosthesis, 
uh, typically your moderate and higher level amputees wearing a laminated socket made of carbon fiber or fiberglass, either one. Uh, this technology of direct socket can be used to fit and deliver a, a, a prosthesis, a prosthetic socket in a single visit, uh, as long as you have some of the materials already pre-ordered before that patient makes it to your office. Both of these sockets in TT and TF employ a hydrostatic concept uh, with an external pressure used for the direct TT version. I've mentioned it's a single visit and it does allow for some, uh, some different types of suspension options, both suction, vacuum, and then also pin suspension. A real brief on how this all works together. Uh, those of you prosthetists are thinking, how in the world can you laminate something on a patient uh, all in one visit? Uh, the way this is done is we don a liner on the patient, we get that in position, and then we use some silicone sheets to be uh, our insulators of, of uh, basically capturing the carbon fiber or the fiberglass material that's uh, it's a, it's a braid that you slip on the patient inside of these two layers of silicone, uh, silicone sleeves, and then you inject a two-part epoxy within 10 minutes. That, uh, that um, epoxy cures, hardens, you can remove that off of the patient, trim up the trim lines. The distal adapter is already incorporated into the fiberglass or the carbon fiber, so you can attach whatever components you need to that. For TT version, we can use an external bladder that helps form that limb with hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and then for TF users, we tend not to use the, um, the bladder as much. And the next slide will just show you what it looks like when someone's uh, being fit with a direct TT. Uh, you've got the bladder activated there, filled with air, creating that pressure during that 10 minute time of the epoxy curing. Once that's cured and this is removed, uh, take that to a lab, trim up the proximal trim lines, assemble the prosthesis, and, and uh, evaluate your fit and send the patient on home with the prosthesis. Both of these sockets are ISO tested and up to 365 pounds. I uh, can't do my math that quickly to remember exactly how many kilograms that is. I think it's about 166. Uh, for TF version of this, we add in an Oser brim, a silicone brim that uh, gives a soft edge to the proximal side, of the, uh, proximal part of the socket, um, and and can be fit as close to the ischium to create a little bit of containment. But many people will will put that brim slightly below the ischial uh, tuberosity as well. Next slide just gives you an idea of what this looks like. Here you see uh, where the prosthetist is shaping the limb and moving. Uh, just like in normal lamination, moving that epoxy up along the limb to uh, impregnate all of the resin of that, uh, that braid that's in there. Uh, I've got somebody mixing the two-part epoxy uh, that goes into the system. And in 10 minutes, while this patient is laying on their side, probably a total of about 30 to 45 minutes of the prep time plus the, the uh, curing time, uh, then you can pull that socket off and do your final trimming again. Next slide here, this, this process shortens our time as prosthetists of needing to, uh, need to do all the interim steps that we typically do in a lab. Those are eliminated with the direct TF and direct TT sockets. Conventional, you might have three visits, but with direct, you can boil that down to as little as two visits, or if you have a pre-stocked office or lab, you can boil this down to even a single visit care. Uh, so think about your, your patients being affected by COVID. They're at home. They gain volume or lost volume for whatever reason. They can make a single visit into your office. You could refit a socket to them and send them home that second day, that same day, and they're ready to go with that new fit. Uh, really a nice advantage of this process. We'll go to the next slide here, Bob. And a few key pointers here on this technology, then I'll hand things back over to Bob, is that, as I've mentioned before, this is a definitive socket. The bottom point below at the bottom of the page here is that this technology is CE marked and ISO tested up to 365 pounds. Uh, it is a one session fitting here. Uh, it, it has clean fabrication. So the, the resin is contained here and there, is not, there are not fumes that are created from this process. 
So it's very clean in that regard as well. So you can do this remotely. You could do it theoretically at a patient's home. You could do it in your office, but you do not have to have special ventilation for this to occur. One other thing that is really nice about this system is your, your patient becomes involved with the process. They see their socket taking shape directly in front of their eyes. They see you making prosthetic-based decisions about where you want to create pressure, about, uh, about uh, the alignment of where that liner goes, about the trim lines and where that all needs to go. You're making those decisions in advance and your, your patient gets to see that process take place. So we've seen patients become much more invested in the process and the success of these sockets. Move to the next slide. We did a longitudinal study over a period of about uh, 22 or so months uh, where 38 users across about four or five different facilities were fit with this socket. And, and there is a study there. Marika is gonna put the, um, the link in the chat section here for this study. Uh, and, and we found that the satisfaction from users was increased 20, almost 30%, even as short as six weeks after the fitting. And it didn't matter whether the person actually needed a new socket or not. It was the same type of satisfactory results. And then their satisfaction with service also went up almost 15%. There is a follow-up study to this that was published just early, earlier this year, uh, that if you just type in direct socket and Marable, into uh, a search engine, you're probably gonna find that second article as well. So final slide here, if you are interested in this information about these two technologies, you can ask any o OSER representative about this, go to OSER's website, type in connect or direct. Uh, and if it's not yet available in your location, um, we are probably already thinking about getting it to you, uh, but uh, feel free to contact us for when that might occur. And with that, Bob, I will hand the Zoom stage right back over to you to finish up with some things that we can do at home to stay active and stay flexible. Well, thank you very much, Kurt. It's nice to see that there's options that weren't available uh, even just a few years ago to get folks in and out and to adjust to the changes that have taken place. Sometimes timing is everything in this world. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is just share with you, uh, OSER is uh, always delivering, and OSER has a long partnership with Challenge Athletes Foundation, and again, they teamed up last year about this time to what can we do for our folks? We're not running our uh, running clinics and the other sports clinics, and so uh, we put together a video of things that folks might do at home just to try to maintain their strength, their flexibility, their agility. Um, so when it was time to get back in the game, they could do so um, without all the issues that many folks are facing. So you can go onto YouTube, there's links at OSER and you'll have uh, a QR code at the end that will take you there as well. So um, this is, uh, uh, Sarah, and um, she's helped us out, and you can do one of two things. The biggest issue is when we sit all day, we watch too many Netflix, and we eat too many chocolate chip cookies, um, get tight hip flexors, and being that most people that wear transfemoral prostheses already have a reduced range of motion, uh, is even compounded with long bouts of sitting like we've had to do during quarantine. So you can go on Amazon and help fund the next space shot by uh, Mr. Bezos into space um, and get one of those straps for uh, just a few bucks. Or if you notice to the left, you could just take an old belt. The idea is that it wraps around the ankle and that you put just enough tension in order to keep the uh, hip flexors in a position in which they're stretched. The idea is uh, if you can hold for 10 seconds, then relax for 10 seconds, that's a great starting point. The literature tells us that if you can go to 30 seconds and hold it, that's even better. Optimal, most people don't do this, not even uh, elite athletes, is 90 seconds. How many do you have to do? No more than three to five. You do not need to do a lot with stretching. You just need to do it on a daily basis or at best every other day. The other um, thing, don't forget that it's not, just not the prosthetic limb that you want to keep in mind, but you do need to 
uh, work with the sound limb because you want to maintain symmetry between both limbs with range of motion. So you can take the same strap, you can take the same belt, you can put it around the ankle and you can go ahead and stretch out the, uh, uh, the intact limb as well as the um, prosthetic limb. Then the next is the hamstring stretches. And so, whoops, hamstring stretches, going back, hamstrings are, are important. They ha can help to reduce low back pain. Um, so the one thing that you want to keep in mind is to bring the opposite limb up, whether it's the prosthetic limb or the sound limb, uh, and that will reduce the stress that will be placed on your back. But the idea is that you bring this limb up underneath, you're probably not going to stretch as far as Sarah did, but that's okay, um, is just stretch as, as far as you can, keeping your back erect, again, 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, um, 90 seconds, well, if you're really tight and you're comfortable and what the heck, you're watching the old reruns of Breaking Bad, you got nothing else to do, then hold it for 90 seconds and you're in good shape. And again, don't forget the sound limb. The hip abductors uh, stretch, what are the hip abductors? Ah, they're the muscles on the side of your buttocks. And uh, for those clinicians out there that you're probably very well aware, we call this the piriformis stretch. You bring your knee up to your chest. Um, then you bring the knee across your body to the opposite shoulder. Um, piriformis is an abductor. It's also a rotator. And keeping that muscle stretch um, is important. So you want to stretch out both the uh, muscles on the sound side, um, but you also want to stretch out the muscles on the prosthetic side. And by doing this, um, it can help to reduce some of those issues with rotation that actually can lead to back pain and other issues. The adductors are important. We have Gil here. Uh, Gil is pointing out the adductors by just bringing your feet up, maybe have the soles of your feet facing each other, you can rest your forearms or your elbows on your knees and just push down gently. Um, some may want to use or teach your patients contract, relax, which is just simply have them push up uh, for 10 seconds like he's doing there. Hold, 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 then relax, and then you can stretch out the, uh, the muscles. You really don't want to see any movement when you're having the contraction. Um, he just did that for effect. But stretching out the adductors is um, just as important as the other muscles about the hip. Um, one of the things is getting in and out of the chair. And uh, for many folks, that would be the postural extensors, the, um, the gluteus, the quads, uh, hamstrings, and the plantar flexors. And so these become important. So what you can do is with a sofa or another chair behind you with uh, maybe a couple of pillows, have place a chair in front of you so you can hold on and just stand and come right back up. The key is to focus on the prosthetic limb. Um, there's no doubt that you'll put weight on the intact limb or your patients will put weight on the attack limb. But the idea is that can you put more weight onto the prosthetic limb so you can strengthen those muscles inside the prosthesis. The other thing that I try to convey to the folks I work with is every time you get out of the chair to go to the kitchen, to go to um, another part of the house, always think about pushing down on the prosthetic limb and using as much as possible. Um, one of the things that you can do is you see that little white cloth that is there. Um, that cloth can be used to help facilitate um, the ability for that person when you're sitting down is to keep weight on the heel. That way, if your prosthesis happens to have some kind of a, me a breaking mechanism or a yield rate control, you'll engage that. And then the other thing is it will help to when you stand is to put the weight towards the toe um, and then use your hamstrings to extend the knee. So those are a couple helpful tips. Then the next is that you can always lower uh, the amount of distance. Again, being able to ride the knee down depends on the type of knee you have. With mechanical knees, they're all different. So uh, in this case, Gil has a Rio, so he can ride that knee down. But a mechanical knee, you may not have as much motion uh, there. 
regardless, the idea is to keep those muscles strong using the muscles, not just the sound limb, because that sound limb can be abused. And one of the important things that you want to keep in mind is if the person, like Joe was talking to us about, um, is feels weaker, has gait deviations, and begins to rely on that sound limb, for many folks, that sound limb is not so sound. So there's a real chance that over time, our population of people who have one side of amputation may end up being bilateral. So the ball rolls, we've been doing this forever. You can do a tennis ball, you can have do a basketball, soccer ball, beach ball, doesn't matter. You want to go forwards and backwards, side to side, and rotate once clockwise and then counterclockwise, just as Gil demonstrated. Then that's perturbating distally. If, and this is a real great exercise to have most of my folks do, just take a gallon milk jug. Gallon milk jug filled with milk and or water. Water is better because milk doesn't last so long when you leave it out. Um, it weighs just a little over eight pounds. And so what you can do is create a weighted ball. And it, uh, Gil's doing a great job, but you don't want to tilt from side to side, but you want to rotate. First, keeping your arms in close together then bringing your arms out like he's doing there. And if you notice, he's using the muscles within the socket in his hip, and he's having to keep his legs pretty much firm on the ground while he does that. The way that you can increase the difficulty of the exercise is to bring your feet closer together. And if he does so like he is here, is that it becomes more difficult um, and then if he extends his elbows out, it becomes more difficult as well. By the way, yeah, obviously, if you put half the uh, water in, it's four pounds, or you can use like a quart jug or something of that nature. So there's options. Um, st step ups are one of the best, again, working the quads um, and also the hip extensors. So a person can step up and step down, step up and step down with one leg or alternate back and forth between the limbs. Um, you can just simply go out in the front stoop and use the stairs, or you can have a stool at home. Then what we can do is look at um, quick step, step ups. Now, we don't expect folks to do this. As a matter of fact, this is Eric McElvaney, who's currently in Tokyo competing in the triathlon for the United States. So don't expect your older patients to do this, but your younger transtibial amputees who are gonna to wanna to go back and play basketball and other sports are gonna want things to keep the timing, the speed with their prostheses while they're at home. And these exercises will allow them to do that. The other thing you may wanna look at is um, taking the stool and now working sideways. Remember, the key is, is to work in multiple directions. So not only do you want to work in the sagittal plane, but you want to work in the coronal plane, you want to work in the transverse plane. So uh, in this case, he's going to be working in the coronal or the frontal plane. And again, what Eric is talking about is timing. And for him, he does this quite a bit. And so and he's saying, just keep listening and feel your feet, tap, 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 tap. And you can pick up speed in a controlled manner. And it's an excellent exercise to help when you are participating in sports and doing other things in opposite directions. And as you can see, he's making this look easy. Not quite so easy. Try it at home first before you give it to your patients. And you can see it's a pretty challenging exercise. The other thing is that you can do cup walking. You can do it in the home, or you can make it a little more difficult. You go out on the front and back lawn where there's grass creating compliant surface. And what he's going to do is raise one leg up so the knee comes up waist high. And as he does it, he's balancing over each limb and being able to maintain it in a controlled fashion. The slower you go, the better it is. Then you can do side steps, moving from one side back to the other, going from one side back to the other and working on speed and putting together all the things we talked about with getting that little squat in between. And then finally, braiding, one of the best exercises, multi-directional transverse plane, using all the muscles inside the socket, regardless of age, regardless of level of amputation, I find this to be one of the best exercises along with the ball rolls and step ups in order for a person to be able to maintain their strength. Now, you may want to, your folks may 
you may want to know how well they're doing, and they want to let you know how well they're doing. There's three simple tests everybody can do at home, the timed up and go. I think most people are familiar with it. You just have a chair, you have three meters, 10 feet, and there's a cone. And you ask the person is when they say go, they start the stopwatch, they walk up and around the cone, and they come back and sit down. There are norms that are available um, um, on, in a variety of different ways, but they're actually all over the internet so that you can see just how well a person is doing. But what I like to do is know what that one person is doing. So if they maintain the same, they're maintaining. If they're improving, that means they're getting better. But if they're declining, that may be a cue that you need to come in and see me. The next is the 10 meter walk test. Easy to do, takes a little bit more space. You need about 30 feet, as most people are familiar with that are listening for the 10 meter walk test. Um, you have the person start walking. They walk the first two meters. When they cross the line there, they start the clock. They time themselves in the middle six meters, and then they decelerate on the last two meters. And again, there are norms that are out there, depending on level of amputation, functional level, and it goes on and on. There's some uh, nice work. Uh, Meg Zion has some nice work out of Delaware uh, in an article that was published, actually not this one, but one just recently in 2020, that goes through what are the normative values for a lot of the different um, um, uh, outcome measures that we use. And then finally, the, probably the easiest one is the two minute walk test. Why do I say it's easy? You can measure it anywhere as long as the patient's doing it the same place in the same um, environment over and over again. In other words, if they are going for a walk, maybe they're even taking their dog for a walk. If at some point in that walk, they start the clock for two minutes and then know how much distance that they covered. They can take the car out later on and um, uh, see how far they went or um, they can walk it off and figure out what the, the distance is. And they can report that. That is a way in order to um, be able to see how well they are doing over time with their mobility in terms of uh, walking. Two minute walk test is becoming an international standard. Um, as you can see, there are values um, for different groups, um, but if you notice the mean values are quite different between a research setting and a publication we published by Gennard and another one that we have coming out um, that was uh, published by uh, Chris Shank and uh, Anat Crystal, which looking at in different clinics, you're going to see lower values than what you see in published research because the environment's different. You can't, um, don't have the space. You have to go in and around the front desk. You got to go past a number of doors uh, and you don't have the typical distance. So as long as you do it in the same place at the same time, the patient does it in the same place at the same time or the, the same environment rather um, at home, you can continue to follow those numbers. So the idea is that those are some easy exercises. They are available on the OSA website. And one of the measures that anybody can do at home or you can do it in the clinic to see how well a pa patient is doing is the tug test, the 10 meter walk test and the two minute walk test. So the idea is we got to come up with solutions because people are not going to want to travel as often to see us, but we got to keep them healthy because Ultimately, they are our patients, our responsibilities, and many uh, responsibility in many cases. Um, we have a very strong relationship with them. With that, I cannot thank Oser enough for the opportunity to chat with everybody. Thank Joe for um, sharing with us. And with that, I will turn it back to Kurt. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, excellent. Uh, I have a few questions uh, from the Q&A box for, for you, Bob, and then also for Joe. And uh, so we'll, we'll go through a few of these questions while we still have some time. Uh, first one, uh, Joe, if you can bring up your, your camera. I'll start with you, Joe. Uh, and okay, there you are. Just want to make sure you're there before we uh, ask you the question. Um, the question is from uh, Joandre. Hopefully, I uh, pronounced that correctly. But uh, it is: Can you remember what your volume loss was over a 12-month period, a year or two prior to COVID? And um, is that one inch that you lost during COVID 
does it compare normally to what you had lost previously or or was that uh, something different than what you might have lost before that now the the two the one inch loss that i talked about was actually over uh, almost two years uh, a year of uh, the last year 14 months was in covid um i had had the, the sock at the same socket a year prior to covid starting so um it was a two-year period and that volume reduction uh, was pretty great for one time, uh, one socket. That was probably the greatest reduction I'd had. I'd obviously had others prior to, uh, but they were um, not as much in between socket fitting. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. I think this is uh, this is aimed towards me here. It's from Lucas. It says, is there any limit of time for the user to use the Connect TF socket? Uh, or could, could the user use it during the entire day? Uh, this socket is meant to be used uh, full time, uh, both in, in, in terms of a full day, but also used in, in full time as, it, as in terms of months and years, uh, warranted up to two years. Uh, but yes, it can be used full-time. It's intended as a full-time use socket, but we realize it's going to be most effective uh, for those times when somebody might be uh, ramping up their use of a prosthesis or maybe slowing down in their later years or people that may have just a little bit lower activity level. Uh, we have another question here then for Bob, and we'll finish up with this question here. Bob, uh, you know, with all of these, uh, these exercises that are available, uh, we, we've heard Joe's story about being uh, remote away from his prosthesis for a while. Uh, what do you see in the, the future here as it relates to um, conveying these exercises or, or offering up services as uh, across the telephone or through FaceTime? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you see coming in the future for that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, thank you, Kurt. Uh, telehealth is here, folks. Um, is during the COVID crisis at our hospital in the University of Miami, 80% of our um, PT visits were through telehealth, um, um, basically uh, working with folks while they were at home and we would do um, uh, remote visits. The idea is the same uh, across the board. Um, the uh, CMS or Medicare is now reimbursing uh, for virtual visits. Um, there are uh, plans by multiple different groups to uh, create a system um, because it only makes sense. Um, most people don't need to get in their car, uh, travel 20 minutes, a half hour, um, they try to find parking. By the time they get into the clinic, they're exhausted. And then we're going to ask them to exercise or sit there while um, we do some minor things prosthetically. I think for physical therapists, it's going to be easier for us to provide exercises um, via video and other mechanisms. We're working on some things as well. I think in, um, in the world of prosthetics, it's going to be a little bit different, but you can triage a lot of things. Oftentimes I know that when you get on the phone with somebody, instead of having them come in, you can find out it's a simple sock issue, it's a cleaning issue, um, it's just a wrapping issue. Um, there are so many things that can be done over the phone. So I think people are thinking, let's talk virtually first and then we can do in person second. Excellent. Yeah, I like how this has application across uh, really all of healthcare, and I think it's probably just our creativity uh, that uh, is what can lead us to those those positive answers. So excellent. Uh, I will uh, will do a close up in just a, a little bit. Uh, I should be you should see a shared screen here where you can email us. You can go to OSER's website, join us on any of our social media. Uh, or get some of the resources that Bob has on his site at, the, at advancedrehabtherapy.com. On the right-hand side, if you hover your phone over that, that QR code, uh, you, will, you will get a link to the YouTube video that is basically a compilation of the exercises that you saw uh, Gil and Sarah and Eric all do and what Bob so uh, greatly explained. Uh, so you have that available as well. 
I'd like to take this time uh, to just give a, a thank you to Joe uh, for joining us, for taking the time to deal with me uh, and putting this video together. Uh, I think we all appreciate just seeing your your viewpoint on, on your life as an amputee in this challenging time. So thank you again for that. Uh, and, and then also, uh, Bob, of course, always bringing us great information, new and, and, and cutting information, um, and, and for leading us in, in helping us care for amputees and their prostheses. We really appreciate all of your expertise with that as well. Uh, as we close here, what I'd like to do is um, get ready to use that raise hand function, but uh, you'll see in your screen as well the upcoming events on October 7th um, and then on December 9th, talking about getting back to sport and talking about the application of power in prosthetics. Uh, so we look forward to having you at those events. Let's close up today by uh, raising your hands as an applause for Bob and for Joe. Uh, we thank you so much for your expertise and your time spending with us. And uh, for the rest of you, thank you for your time and spending uh, an hour and a half with us at OSER uh, and, and sharing this time with you. We look forward to seeing you all in person sometime down the road. And uh, I'll just ask you to think a little bit about what you learned today. Spend a few minutes thinking about ideas of how this can apply to your care of amputees and their life with their prostheses, ultimately so that we can give life without limitations. So thank you all for, for your time, your attention, and uh, we'll be finishing up the webinar here in just a moment.